everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. And every week, a new guest is here to share their work, inspire a little creativity, and help you improve your photography skills. The schedule for our upcoming presentations are on my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to previous episodes on my YouTube channel. Tonight's guest is Paul Malinowski. Paul is a fine art photographer based in Colorado, whose portfolio includes portraiture, nature, abstracts, and architectural photography. Paul's work is inspired by the poetry of Robert Frost and Emily Dickinson, and artists Hopper and Constable. The underlying theme of his images are best described by the tagline on his website, visually interpreting the present moment. You can check out his images, blog, and acquire some of his work through his website at paulmalinowskiphotography.com. In tonight's presentation, Luna Quest, the 2020 Full Moon Project. Paul set out in January of 2020 to not only photograph every full moon throughout the year and locations across the state of Colorado, but to also journal about his experience. In this presentation, Paul will share images of each monthly full moon, the pitfalls of planning and implementing a year-long project, detailed planning and shooting tips for, photog for photographing the moon, and much more. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Paul. Thank you so much, Linda, and thank you to everybody for attending tonight. So I... I before you start, uh-uh, yeah. uh-uh. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, so now we have the, you know, Linda's confession time, because sometimes for me, people will ask me, where do you find these people? How do you get them to come and do this? What kind of blackmail pictures? Because I do have some <laughs> on a few of you, but um, most of you know, we reference this enough times. Um, I had attended the Out of Chicago conference a couple of years ago and and uh, became friends with the... Um, the people that run it, and when they um, decided to do a virtual conference, um, they asked me to be a host, and I have been uh, honored to, to help them out the last three conferences that they've done. In the last conference, they, they decided to do something different, and they invited some of the attendees to come and do a, a very brief presentation, and I, I don't remember how many. There probably were six, seven, eight people that did presentations and they were all very, very good. And the two that really caught my attention was Paul's and Liz Crane, who was our speaker for next week. And um, Paul's present, both of them were limited to seven minutes. And I remember Paul finishing and I'm like, what do you mean he's finished? He hasn't finished. They only gave him seven minutes. And I thought, hmm. And so I sent him a note as I did Liz and said, look, I saw you. Um, I know there's more to your presentation than the seven minutes they allowed you. So if you're interested, please come. And that is why Paul is here. And so I am very, very thrilled, honored, giddy um, that you said yes, because you don't know me. And I, other than Liz, um, I don't think you know anybody else in this room. So to come wow. and speak to our group is a, a huge, huge thing for this project that I started at the beginning of the pandemic. So thank you. Um, I did a brief intro for you. If there's something I missed out that you'd like to, to share and, and is, is important that you're like, let me get this on record of you know how many awards you've won or if you're on the cover of Nat Geo, please, please share that with us because uh, I, I, I will promise you that if the people in the room haven't looked you up, they will by the time you're done, so. Well, good, I, I would encourage them to uh, look me up. Um, don't, don't Google any past transgressions I've done. <laughs> Statute of limitations has run out on all of them, I assure you, but no, I'm kidding. Uh, your, your intro was perfect, really nothing else to add. Um, if you go to my website, you, you will learn more about awards and uh, books I've been published in and things like that. But um, we don't need to waste time with that. Even though I have more than seven minutes, which 
this is a treat, Linda, to have more than seven minutes because at that out of Chicago, I was talking like this, like when I, I grew up in Chicago. And so I used to talk like that and I don't want to talk like that. So thank Scary you. Stuff. You're, yes. Uh, let me get back to your website real quick because I spent a little bit of time stalking you before I invited you. And one of the um, galleries that you have is on trees. So if you only look at one thing on his website, go look at the trees because I love photographing trees and he's got some amazing um, images. Very impressive. So, okay. All right. I'm going to hush it and then let you take over. So feel free to start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. Or if and um, <clears throat> so again, thank you everybody. And thank you for your attention. And Yes, you will see me raise a uh, wine glass now and then. You know, I misinterpreted it said happiness hour, but I interpreted it as happy hour. So I poured myself a nice, I find that Pinot Noir works best for giving talks like this. And Liz may remember that throughout my talk, I was doing this the whole time and out of Chicago too. So um, anyways, this is, <clears throat> so this is actually a combination of two or three different talks that I've given. And I've given this talk to uh, non-photographers who, you know, they don't know an f-stop from a bus stop. And so, you know, it's, it's a lot more generic. It's more about the journey, which actually I find was really sort of the key thing for me. And yes, we'll, you're all photographers. I promise we'll get into the weeds of um, what settings I used and things like that. And, you know, that's important. I'm, I'm also nerdy, so um, I, I like that. But I, I really meant for this to be an art project. So I called the Luna Quest. It's the full moon project from 2020. And by the way, at the bottom there, you'll see, I also put it in the chat room my website, my email. Actually, I didn't put my email in the chat, but it's everything is Paul Malinowski Photography. And that's my Instagram. Uh, I do have a Facebook. I don't use it as much, but it's also Paul Malinowski Photography. So if you can remember Paul Malinowski Photography, you'll remember everything. So what were the goals of the project that I was trying to do? Well, I wanted to photograph all 13 months of the full moon in 2020. And I know what you're thinking, but Paul, there's not 13 months in a year. <laughs> and you're right, but there were 13 full moons, which only happens once in a blue moon. And indeed 2020 had the blue moon, which actually, if, if we were doing this more interactively, I'd ask you, does anybody know when the blue moon was in 2020? And since I can't tell and we need to move along, I will tell you it was on Halloween, which was really perfect. Um, another goal of my project initially was to go to locations throughout the state of Colorado. And I live in Colorado and you know, great, beautiful state with lots to photograph. Uh, that had interesting foregrounds like the Great Sand Dune National Park we have here. We have Rocky Mountain National Park, many, many places like that. Um, I didn't quite get there and we'll talk about that <laughs> as to, and I think you know why. Uh, and then I journaled about it each month and I love to write. You know, my other creative outlet was writing. Uh, I actually wrote a um, full play years ago, had it produced, et cetera. So I love to photograph and then write about it. And it also helps because the older you get, uh, your memory starts going a little bit. So it's good to be able to refer back to it. And you know, I, I did everything from what the weather was like, what my ideas were that month, uh, settings I used, things like that. Um, another goal of the project was to avoid compositing elements. In other words, when, when I give this to non-photographers, I call it Photoshopping. Everybody, you know, everybody knows what that means in the generic sense. Those of us that are photographers know that Photoshop is a wonderful editing program. And so it doesn't have to be compositing. But, and there's nothing wrong with compositing. I'm not anti-compositing, but... I just wanted for this to be 
everything from where I was standing. And even if it was two or three different shots that I blended, and we'll talk about that, why you blend and when you blend when you're shooting the moon. Uh, but that was really important to me. So hopefully from this, you'll have some takeaways. You'll have some takeaways of what the pitfalls and the joys of planning and implementing a photography project are. I've never done one, so I had both, <laughs> pitfalls and joys. You'll learn basic moon astronomy. Now, why would you wanna know that? Well, you'll see, um, and, and I'll get into that. And it's, it's not, don't worry, it's not physics, um, you know, graduate level. It's very, very basic. Uh, takeaways of working around when you have roadblocks, such as in my case, bad weather. If you have clouds, how do you see the moon? Well, there's actually, believe it or not, ways to work around it. And then I ran across this thing called COVID, which we still all deal with. And so that actually had both a negative and a very positive impact. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, another takeaway is just how to plan and shoot for photographing the moon. So I'm going to weave in some planning tips, some shooting tips as you see some of these images. And let me caveat by saying we all hate, uh, uh, God, what is it, PowerPoint presentations. And this is, you know, the verbiage of this is all up front you'll be seeing a lot of images, as I say here, that you'll see some pretty cool images and you'll see some clunkers that, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share, I, uh, I have no ego. <laughs> and then the last and the most important is inspiration. So, we're, you know, you don't have to go out and shoot the full moon like I did, but if this inspires you to just do something, um, maybe photograph bees on flowers, um, great project. That'd be wonderful to see. So that's what I'm hoping you'll get this. And then you may ask, well, why did I do this particular project? So when I was a young boy, probably 11 or 12, my parents bought me a telescope and it was probably the best Christmas gift I ever got. It was very inexpensive. I'm sure we didn't have a lot of money, but, uh, and as I mentioned, I grew up in Chicago, which is not exactly dark sky uh, country. In fact, the only thing you can see in the sky in the city of Chicago is the moon. So my dad and I would go out and we rigged up this board where we put the tripod on and we would look at the moon. And it's funny, I mean, I would do that. I would bug him to take me out every night. And yeah, I saw the same thing, obviously. It's the same craters, uh, but I was just fascinated. And then as I got into photography, I was really into photographs that had the moon in them. I just felt they had a certain artistic element to them that was, I didn't see anything else like that. And I've always wanted to do a single purpose photography project. And so I sort of realized, duh, the light bulb came on. Let's do something with the moon and let's do full moon and let's do it for a full year. This is not from the full moon project, but I wanted to give you an example of why I, this, you know, this was something I was really interested in, eclipses. This is a lunar eclipse. This is specifically the one from January, 2018. And by the way, I'm going to assume there's not an internet lag. And if you're, uh, Linda, you know, you wave to me, I can see you if for some reason a photograph doesn't come up and I'm explaining it and everybody's probably going, what is he talking about? But I'm, gotcha. I'm going to assume it's up. Okay. So um, this is a composite, uh, obviously, <laughs> and it's a composite of eight photos, uh, six of the moon in various stages of the eclipse, uh, one of just the dark sky, which I probably took about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, the eclipse was from three to about five o'clock. And then the mountains that you see there in the background uh, are in the four, well, <laughs> I guess technically that's the foreground. So, um, and, and by the way, this was taken one block from my house. So I didn't have to go way out into the mountains. Now I'm lucky where I live. I live on a little hill and I, you know, you can't see the development way at the bottom, I've cut that off. But um, 
you know, I, I, I personally love this photo. I've sold a lot of prints of this. I call it evolution of an eclipse, but it's just to show you that why I was, you know, how I've gotten interested in uh, moonshots. So what challenges happen? Well, uh, for this specific project, I had very little flexibility, a little more than I thought, and we're going to talk about that. But, um, you know, it had to be the full moon. Well, so it's not like you can say, well, I didn't get it tonight. I'll wait two weeks and then I'll go get the full moon again, right? No, that doesn't work that way. Um, challenge of any project, life happens. And um, indeed, I do family caregiving for a family member. And I had a family member who wound up needing very serious surgery uh, during this and spent two weeks in the hospital. And I spent the two weeks with her. And it was during the lockdown. And so the hospital let me stay, but I had to agree never leave the premises. And so for two weeks, I never left. Now, the good news is the surgery, the most important is that the surgery was extremely successful. Um, so that's fantastic. The other side of this is that during those two weeks, there was no full moon. Um, had there been a full moon, that would have been the end of the project. But you know, that happens with everybody. And then specifically for this weather and, you know, um, really bad weather can really ruin trying to shoot uh, the full moon or anything in the sky as we know. So throughout this, I'll be giving you planning tips, which to me are the most important. And then I'll throw in shooting tips for again, our tech, tech talk portion of that, of uh, settings. So, um, if you're sitting there and you want to take notes, don't worry. Uh, what I'll do, send me an email if you like. I'll put the seven planning tips and four shooting tips in a PDF, and I'll email it to you. So you don't have to take a you know picture of the screen right now. And I know this will go up on YouTube, but sometimes people, especially those of us of a certain generation, prefer to read and have it in our hand. So I will send that to you. So right off the bat, before I start showing you all these images, planning tip number one is to find an interesting foreground or composition. So the more interesting the foreground or the rest of the photo, the more interesting the photo. And you know, a few years ago, uh, there's a fellow I know in our photography club who does amazing Milky Way shots. And he explained to us that the key was the foreground. You can shoot the Milky Way, and that's kind of interesting. But if you don't have, you know, uh, a sand dune in front of it or uh, an abandoned farmhouse in front of it, it's not as interesting. So that was that's tip number one, and that the composition should really stand on its own, and the moon should be the chef's kiss, if you will. And so I always say the moon should be in a uh, you know co-starring role or a supporting role but not a solo act. And here's what I mean. So this shot, which is from my full moon project is, and it's not the shot, I have what I call the shot of the month. And uh, I'm actually doing a calendar on this that will have the shot of the month. This is not the shot of the month, but I, I like this. And so, you know, this is a nice shot even without the moon, right? And the reflection, but I think the moon and the reflection of it just really enhanced this. Uh, substantially. In this shot, which is not part of the full moon project, um, you probably went immediately to the dramatic clouds. These are called nematis clouds, and they're very rare, and they were amazing that night. But if you look down here, hey, there's a full moon that came up. And so, and this was actually taken about two, three years ago. I was sitting on my front porch, uh, drinking a glass of wine, watching these clouds form. And um, so, you know, I think though, although the Mimatis cloud shot would be incredible by itself, the fact that the moon is in it as a full moon is even more amazing. And in fact, this shot was used two nights in a row by one of our local television stations as their lead in to their weather report. The fact that it was on the second night just blew me away, so. And this is what I mean by a solo act. And, you know, I see these on Instagram and I, I and, you know, forgive me if any of you have posted these and, you know, it's interesting the first time, but where did you take this? 
Um, what time of the year did you take this? Um, you know, it just, it, it, what's the artistic element of this? You know, it just, it's, it's fine if you're doing, as I say, the website of the Adler Planetarium of Chicago, but as art, I don't consider this really art. So, well, Paul, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, um, go ahead. Before you go to the next piece of it, there was a question that jumped in um, on the previous photo with the clouds. So um, someone, Ben is wanting to know if you wouldn't mind sharing the focal length um, that you use, because he says the moon kind of appears too big for a wide angle shot. So he's just a little curious. So yeah, this was one I did blend. Um, and so I did actually take, and again, this was not part of my project. project. Okay. So this is, yeah, as you can tell the, by the distortion on the sides, this was a wide angle shot. And then from the exact same spot, I took this of the full moon, but even that was only probably, and, and I'll talk about, you know, the lenses I use, I tend to use 70 to 200 the most. So, okay. you know, if, if you did anything more than that, it would look really, really funky. And it's not too much bigger. I mean, yeah, the moon would be maybe half that size at that. I think this is actually at 30 millimeters. So, you know, I probably went to 100 millimeters. So it's only about three times. Okay, yeah, but, thank you. Yeah. I just didn't want to get it get so far off that yeah. you have to backpack, backpack, yeah. back, back. I don't, <laughs> I don't know the words. I don't want to backpack while I'm doing this. No. <laughs> I may be drinking so, wine over here too. Okay. <laughs> So planning tip number two is that, uh, so here's your basic astronomy class. The full moon only lasts a minute. Actually, I, I believe it only lasts a few seconds, but you have three days to shoot it. So what do I mean by that? Well, what you do is you find the date of the full moon and you know you just go to any calendar, it'll tell you what that date is. And then you apply what I call the 97% rule. And what I mean by that is the human eye cannot detect um, less than 3% of a full moon. In other words, 97% or more of a full moon looks like a 100% full moon. And I'm gonna show you here, one of these images, and I realize you know, they're not exposed exactly the same. I mean, I just went into the library and pull these out, but one of these is at 97% and one of these is at 100%. So, um, and you know what? I never wound up labeling. So to this day, I don't know which is which. Uh, I suppose I could go back to the metadata and find it, but you see my point, right? So um, what that means is that, and, and the reason this is important. Again, it's kind of nice now that you know you've got really three nights and days to shoot the full moon. It's not what your calendar says, the full moon. The full moon, again, only lasts a minute, but you have three days to shoot. So the actual full moon might be during the middle of the day and it's not even visible. So don't try and shoot the full moon during those 10 seconds when it's 100% lit. Uh, again, it might be below the horizon. So no one, you know, if someone says, well, that wasn't really the day of the full moon, it was the day before, you know, explain to them, yeah, I didn't have time for that five seconds while it was under the horizon to get to South America and go see it, you know? So, um, so really you have six opportunities per month. So what do I mean by that? So let's call day one, the day before the full moon and you have the moon rise and the moon set. Um, day two, let's call the day of the full moon. You have the moon rise and the moon set. And day three is the day after the full moon and you have the moon rise and the moon set. None of those days will the moon be less than 97% lit up, okay? So that's why those three days are actually days of the full moon. And, um, and why do I say moonrise and moonset and not just during the day? Well, think about where the moon is during the day and think about a foreground. 
there's you're you know the moon is overhead maybe directly overhead at 90 degrees you're not going to be able to get any interesting foreground which was tip number one you'll get that same shot i showed you where it's a solo act and you know if you do 12 months of that who cares that's like the worst art project ever made <laughs> so a uh, good Here's the good news. That means you have to have three straight nights or three straight mornings of very, very bad weather with clouds to ruin a full moonshot. So I only came close once. Now I realize if you live in Seattle where I lived um, for a couple of years, years ago, um, yeah, you may wind up in December and January and February and March. Um, having solid clouds just on end. But for most of us, the odds of having six of those opportunities to get the full moon are next to nothing. Or, I mean, you've got a full opportunity, I should say. So planning tip number three, and I promise the images are coming after this one. You only need to know moonrise and moonset times of the day of the full moon. My talk out of Chicago actually had a subtitle, and the subtitle was um, uh, without using a, uh, a, an, an app, I think was something to that effect. Because most of us, you know, don't want to fiddle with an app. Full disclosure, I do use photo pills, but I get really deep into the weeds on this. I use also the photographers of femurs and something called Sun Surveyor but you don't need to. So um, here's what, you just need to know the time of the moonrise and the moonset, the day of the actual full moon. And then you can estimate them for the day before and the day after. This is again, kind of your basic astronomy. Now, if you wanna know when the moonrise and moonset is of the day of the full moon, there's a, plenty of websites, but one I use is called timeanddate.com. Real simple, you just put in where you're located and it'll tell you when the moon rises, when the moon sets. There's tons of different, even probably your weather app will tell you that, my weather app does. Here's something, um, again, basic astronomy without you know very basic level. The day of the full moon, pretty much the moon rise will equal the sunset. It's almost within minutes of each other every month, right? So that's, that's a really easy thing to remember. The sun uh, sets and rises a difference of about a minute a day, but the moon every day will rise and set a difference of about 75 minutes. So it's a little over an hour and it becomes later each day. Now, what does that mean? It means when the day of a full moon, you will, as the sun sets, the moon rises. From a photography standpoint, that means you're probably going to get a shot at blue hour. Beautiful time to shoot, right? We all love that and we shoot for that. The day before, the moon will rise about 75 minutes earlier. And what's that time? Golden hour. So. You can control the look of the photograph you're going for by just knowing if you want that day or the day before. And what if you go the day after? If you go the day after, it's about an hour after sunset. And so basically it's your nighttime shot. And you'll see, and I've got shots of all of these. So you'll, you'll see what I mean. So let's start with a month. So here's January. My goal there was to get the skyline of Denver. What you're going to see here first is that planning tip number one is about how the moon shrinks, sharpens, and brightens as it rises. So it really changes from the horizon as it gets into the sky. Here's a bad shot. I'm going to start with, a, oh, I say not really, haha, -ha, but it appears that way. Yeah, of course the moon doesn't sharpen or shrink. You know, it's all reflected light. The moon itself doesn't rise. Uh, technically, you know, we talk about star trails. Well, it's the Earth that rotates. It's not stars. But you know, let's let's stay with the simple generic stuff. And then you'll you'll see some examples of atmospheric distortion here, and and even pollution, which which hangs sort of at the level of the atmosphere. And it can be your friend. 
in, in this first shot, it's not. So here was one of the first, this is January. This was as the moon was rising. This is not a good shot in my opinion. But you know, you can see I was going for the blue hour at the time, very blue. I, I may have enhanced it. But look at how the moon here is very distorted. And some of this is pixelation because I blew it up a little bit. But um, it's not very clear. I would never be able to get that uh, sharper as it was. And that month was really interesting. As the moon rose, it was pink. As it got a little higher, it got orange. And then when it got even maybe 15, 20 degrees altitude, it became white, the typical white moon we see. It's really a fun, fun night. So here's sort of the shot of the month that I went for. And yes, this one is also um, blended two shots. Again, one of my goals, um, and this is one of the few that is actually, but was to stand in the same place. So I, I never moved the whole time, you know, two feet either way. So uh, this was probably 70, this was actually, I can tell you this, I was maybe 15 miles away from downtown Denver. And so I was using a 400 millimeter. This is also cropped. And uh, you know, now I think about it, I may not have even done a second shot on this um, because it's, it's pretty heavily cropped. So, um, because again, I was using 400 millimeters um, and it was so far away, I was able to get the moon to look like that. In fact, I'm almost positive I didn't on this one. And by the way, always when you're doing this, and, and you know, we know this before, we're, we're always told, always look back, look up, look to the left, look to the right. Just don't focus on what you're literally focusing on. I took this shot from a, a little park, a little, the, a trail actually, in, way in Western Colorado. And um, as the light was going down, you know, I thought I was gonna be bored and I started shooting around me and uh, the light was fabulous here. And some of you may have heard of our famous outdoor entertainment uh, center called Red Rocks Amphitheater, where you know tons of bands uh, play, and I've been there. This actually, this little area up here is Red Rocks, so I was right there. And thus, when the when the light is in the golden hour here, the the Red Rocks are incredible. Uh, here's another one of that, and so you know it gave me something to do while I was waiting for just the right time. So here's shooting tip number one, gear, and I mentioned this already. I used my 70 to 200 and my 100 to 400 the most by far. And I'd say the 70 to 200 at 200, you could, you know, if you wanted to just use one lens, that's it at 200 and you can pretty much, you know, get fantastic shots. You can use a wide angle uh, like I did on the Mamatis and then, you know, take a shot with a little longer lens and then combine them in Photoshop, perfectly fine. The farther the foreground, the longer the lens you can use. So like that Denver skyline, and you'll see that's probably the farthest one I ever took. Uh, I've got one where I'm maybe 500 feet away. And so um, I did not use a 400 millimeter on that one. Now, February, I subtitled a lucky second chance. And the reason is this is where weather came in. My original plan was to go on to I-70 and there's a pull off in the mountains and it's just gorgeous. And you and I knew from using photo pills where the full moon would set in the morning. It was going to be behind the mountain and it was, I was going to get the um, uh, car trail lights, you know, it was just going to be incredible. But unfortunately, we knew that um, there was a storm coming in and, and not just a storm, but a blizzard. And so the night before I thought, you know, I better play it safe and I better go somewhere else. And with about 10 minutes to spare, I went to a reservoir that is near our house. <clears throat> this is 10 minutes from my house. And it had just snowed. It was February, you know, lots of snow. And this is an example here of, and this is one of my favorite shots from the year. Very minimalist, almost watercolor look to it. And probably my most popular print from the series too. 
is um, that full moon you see here, there's sort of a magenta layer. That is atmospheric distortion and pollution, which believe it or not, can give you a beautiful effect. And you can see how faint the moon was. I remember standing there and looking for it and realizing, oh my God, it's been rising there the whole time and I missed it. Um, but uh, these people here were ice, uh, ice fishing a little off to the side and it was just uh, one of my favorite shots. In March, um, I had all kinds of plans in March. I was going to an area near my house, actually, that was um, has beautiful mountain views and I wanted to get the moon setting over the mountains. Well, I scouted uh, the night before, and this is planning tip number six, PSF. And if you don't know what PSF means, and you shouldn't, because I made it up, it means plan, scout, and be flexible. So this month, I really, I did all of those. I planned to go to a specific place called Daniels Park here. I scouted it the night before, even one of the full, or the, the first night of potentially the full moon. Now this is looking the wrong way. This is where the moon was going to set, but look at the clouds here. And I can tell you, I didn't realize it at the time, but those clouds never left. Um, it's actually kind of a cool shot regardless. Um, but I went back the next morning, those clouds were even thicker. There was no way to see the moon setting over that. But you know what? I turned to the left and I got this shot, which again, one of my favorite shots from this. And there's no moon in it, but um, how lucky was that? I mean, it was just gorgeous to have those low lying clouds. But it meant still, now I'm on the day of the full moon. That night I had to go to Boulder, which is about 30 miles from here. And I had some business to do, I couldn't take it. So now I'm down to my last day, the day after. So I decided to get up early in the morning and go get a shot. This is where I found out <laughs> that uh, no matter what time it says the moon will set, if you're right in front of a mountain, that means the moon is way higher than what you thought it was. And this can also be true with a building, which means moon set, if it says it's 5.30, it really means 4.30, right? And, oh, I had one more shot. This was on the way down. Uh, again, just, you know, making maybe lemonade out of lemons, the old saying, uh, just gorgeous clouds those morning. So, but this is what I was referring to. So I got up out of my hotel room and I walked out and, oh my God, the moon was just about going down. This is not my shot of the month. Um, but I was worried I'd never, I wouldn't make it to where I was wanted to go to. There's an interesting rock formation outside of Boulder called the Flatirons. And that's what I wanted to get in the foreground. And so this was unfortunately not uh, a great shot, but it was my insurance shot, just in case I never got a shot. But I got there just in time. And this is uh, one, this is not composited. Um, I don't remember exactly. I've got my list of settings here. I can look at that later. But uh, I fortunately, I was able to nail this one just as the sun was coming up. It was nice, soft light. And that little bit of clouds, there was the color to it was a little bit of magenta. It was just, I, I was ecstatic to get it. Then April comes along. What happens in April? Full shutdown, uh, depending on where you are. I know, in, <clears throat> I know, Linda, this is when you wound up, uh, wasn't it in April of 2020 that you founded this because you were, you know, everybody was told to be at home. In Colorado, we were told, don't go more than 10 minutes from your house. Well, I thought that was the end of my full moon project, <clears throat> but actually I started doing walks around my neighborhood. And, you know, I live in boring suburb suburbia and I found that, wait a minute, there's actually some really cool places around here within like six blocks that I didn't know existed in the 30 years I've lived here. I mean, that's embarrassing, but thank God I was able to find that. And um, so roadblocks can sometimes be an opportunity and specifically the lockdown. And here's, 
here's where I wound up taking, this was my shot of the month. So this is a little church that I'm actually standing in a residential subdivision between two houses here and here. And this is about probably 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, something like that. Um, I did this really, really fast because I knew that people in the neighborhood were going to see me setting the tripod up. They were going to call the police. And so I wanted to get the shot before I got run out of there. Um, and in fact, on next door, that app, somebody said, did you see this guy with a camera, you know, blah, blah. And so it was kind of, kind of scary, but I wound up getting a really great shot. I thought one shot, no, you know, no um, compositing here. The night before, I went, I actually had some really good shots in April. This is an LDS, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I believe it is. We have, they have a beautiful temple right by. And so I went the night before for golden hour. And by that time, it was kind of between golden and blue. And again, this time I used uh, photo pills. This is not blended. This is one shot. Um, I got the angel pointing his trumpet at the uh, moon, and I personally, I love this shot. And then you can see the pullback from here. Now, this I went that the day after the full moon to show you how different it can be from the, the shot that was the day before the full moon. So I went for a nighttime shot here in um, black and white, which it really is black and white. So. Um, planning tip number seven is know what an azimuth is. So this is the only technical thing that I recommend you know. You see, I've got a picture of a compass there. So what is it? It's, if you can read a compass, you can read an azimuth. And this threw me for like years, and it's so simple. Azimuth is nothing more than a direction of a compass bearing from due north all the way around the compass. There's 360 degrees in a circle, so that's a compass, right? Absolute east is 90 degrees. Absolute south is 180 degrees. West 270 and back to north is both zero and 360. That's important because if you're trying to line up buildings like I did back here, I wanted, you know, and the shot here, I had to know the azimuth. I had to know where the moon always rises in the east. It's just like the sun. But where in the east? That can be from straight north, zero, down to straight south, 180 degrees. Um, and I'll show you some uh, things about that. Oh, yeah, here, the moonrise azimuth at my latitude, and it differs for every latitude, is between 57 and 122 degrees. So if you're trying to line something up in the foreground, that's the one time you might want to use something like photo pills. But again, you can just Google, what's the azimuth for the moonrise on you know, October 21st? And you'll get it. So let's go to May. In May, I wanted to give thanks. Um, all the healthcare workers that were you know, putting their lives on the line back then, no vaccine. Um, and so I wound up doing our local hospital. I live one block from a hospital. And here you're going to see where I had to use some exposure techniques. Um, so know when to blend exposures. The moon's very bright at night and you have to do a shot exposed for the darker foreground and then one for the bright moon. The moon is surprisingly bright. Um, and I think that's most bad shots of the moon you see, the moon is totally blown out as a highlight. And that's why. And you really do have to blend the two. So the moon, moon, also shutter speed. The moon moves very fast. Any exposure longer than about 1 1 25th second without a tripod, or I'd say 1 30th of a second without a tripod, you'll see little moon trails. And that can be a nice effect if you really exaggerate it. But if you have just a little bit of it, then to me, it doesn't look all that great. Don't be afraid to bump up your ISO if you have to. I was just talking to a photographer that I met today at a park um, about topaz denoise. And, you know, it's amazing. It's just incredible what it does. And, you know, now uh, I'll shoot at 6,400 ISO. I could care less because topaz is going to take care of it. Here's an example. So here's where I had exposed for the hospital. And then 
here's where I had to expose for the moon. Same, you know, focal length and uh, same spot I stood at. And then I blended those two and I got this shot, my final shot. And by the way, as Linda mentioned, I, my favorite artist is Edward Hopper. And I um, did a little tribute to Hopper here. If you, any of you are familiar with, with his work, with uh, lights emanating from windows and, and sort of almost being a voyeur. And I made sure no one was in the window, you know, that if, if someone was trying to um, zoom in on this, they're not going to see anything. But that was my May shot. In June, I go to my secret place. My secret place is this little park about a mile from my house. It's, it's no bigger than a pond. This was a golden hour shot. And you may even miss here where the moon, the full moon is. Uh, in fact, this one came, the moon rose like about a, a little more than an hour before, I'd say about an hour and a half almost before um, uh, sunset. So it's really very bright. Uh, but, and again, because of golden hour and these trees are colorful like that all year round. This looks like a fall shot, but it's not. But I love that shot. Um, and this is just to show you my secret place. This is a white egret that I photographed two days after that moonshot at the exact same location that I took the moon. And there's a wood duck that I took two days ago. Um, just some fun shots I threw in. July, 4th of July, I was so excited. Uh, let me see how we're doing on time. I guess we're okay. So 4th of July, um, I thought, wow, I'm going to get fireworks in front of the moon. City of Denver does a great fireworks show. It's done in front of the uh, City uh, Civic Center building. They light it up. Oh, it's just really cool. I've got great shots of that, but none with the moon in it. But this was going to have it. Also, on the other side, depends when you go, the state is the state capitol. And the state capitol has a beautiful dome. And that's how I wanted to shoot that. That was my plan. Well, roadblock that month was politics. And I don't know where you all, where you lived at the time, if you had, there were a lot of riots going on. And in Denver, we had a ton of riots and they all were in that park. And in fact, um, sadly, tragically, a um, person got killed a day or two later after this and during one of those riots. So I decided not to go down there. <laughs> um, and so instead, but I still wanted something sort of patriotic. So this is in Littleton where I live. This is an extremely historic building. Um, I don't have time to give you the history of it, but it really is a cool building. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. So I went, I went July 3rd, the day before, and I was going to get a golden hour shot of the moon coming up over here. Well, actually over here, I was going to be standing more to the left. Well, you see this dark area here, it shouldn't be dark. Those are clouds and the clouds just kept moving in front of the moon. I never got a shot that night. I went back the next night, the 4th of July. Uh, it was supposed to be blue hour, but again, this one, I was very, very close to my foreground. So I had to wait for the moon about an hour to get to there. So it was nighttime. This is my shot of the month for July. This is that cupola you saw. Um, this I had to blend because I had to take my head exposed for the courthouse and then I had exposed for here. Uh, but it is, there's no, you know, no different focal lengths, uh, but just two different blending shots. And these clouds, I had somebody ask me, did I use a, like a long exposure? Because that's kind of what it looks like. But no, this was actually a very sh uh, quick exposure here in the clouds. And um, it's a certain type of cloud that only comes at night. And I knew the name and I've totally forgotten it. But I thought it was really kind of a cool shot. Then in August, this is called Pure Dumb Luck. And this is really cool. I, you can talk about planning, you know, till you're blue in the face. And I do. And it's very important. But every once in a while, it's plain dumb luck. So I scouted. This is a windmill near, uh, believe it or not, in a suburban area here. And I thought that would be cool. And I got my photo pills and I knew the moon was going to come up right behind there. And oh, this is going to be great. 
And there were some really cool clots at the time, but I thought, oh, they'll go away. And when I got there, sure enough, I mean, there were some clouds moving in. This is the shot looking back, right? So again, remember I talked about, you know, turn around, see what's, what's behind you. And that's what I got behind me. It was a really cool shot. But this is what happened. So unfortunately, the clouds got pretty thick. You can still see the moon here and it's blown out. Um, now you've got Saturn and Jupiter here, which was kind of cool. Um, but it really, and you know, and this is the composition I wanted. You can see the windmill here. You can see I wanted like a minimalist look to it but it just didn't work. And I was very disappointed. And I thought, what can I do you know, tomorrow instead? So I packed up and I started walking to my car and I got to my car and just out of the, you know, I put my tripod away, but I still had my camera with me and I still had it turned on. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw something that was, I realized I had like five seconds, if that, to take the shot. And I just prayed I had right settings. I, I couldn't change the settings, uh, but voila, luck. And this is what I got. So this is my shot of the month for August where I got the plane just to go. This is the only shot I got. This is the only one I got. And boy, I just lucked out nailing it. You know, you could composite this, but I get to say this is one shot. September, two places at one time. I wanted to do what's called the boathouse here in Lake Washington. This is the shot I got. This is, as you can see, a blue hour shot. There's a real thin layer of clouds. And what happens is if there's a thin layer of clouds, you tend to get a halo effect. And actually, I thought that was kind of cool. So I kind of left this as it was. And plus, I liked all the reflections. I used little faster speed or slower speed so that I could get the uh, star starburst effects from the lights too, because you have to stop down, you have to do at least F11. And then I knew I could go about 10 minutes away to our train station and get another shot, which I did. And so I got this one where the moon was over Union Station here and just kind of a fun shot. Now, October was two months, two and one. This is the blue moon. So my, ooh, what's that? Well, that's not a full moon. No, that's to remind me that I wanna tell you, I decided to embrace suburbia, <laughs> right? So I thought, let's do a shot that, you know, celebrates the cars and car trails and things like that and, and shopping malls. So I, again, planned and had scouted where I wanted to go. But I was taking a shot of this guy um, just beforehand at a park and he was posing for me and <clears throat> I almost, almost missed getting <clears throat> my shot completely. But I was fortunate. This is the shot I got. I was standing at an overpass. Again, I was fully expecting to be stopped by a um, policeman or somebody. I mean, I wasn't, in, I wasn't in the street. I was just on a sidewalk. But um, this one, yeah, I had to do, so you have to do a long exposure here of about, I think this was probably 30 seconds to get these car trails. Um, and you have to shoot, I may have even gone longer because I wanted to get, again, these starburst effects here in the light. So I may have actually gone over a minute on this one. And then I did one, again, just in the exact same spot, same focal length of the moon, but just a different exposure. And then I blended it. The second one in October was actually at a cemetery, Halloween. Ooh. Um, twice a year, this particular cemetery in Denver actually opens it up to photographers. You have to make a donation to their foundation, which is perfectly fine, and you get free access, which was, it's, it's a blast. I pulled in um, and that I knew I was going to have a good night because look at the coyote right in front of uh, poor Mr. Musser or Mrs. Musser, whoever that was. So shooting tip number four is about focusing. Take two shots, one focused on the foreground and one on the moon. And again, sometimes you have to also do different ones because of the exposure. Use live view if you have a DSLR. I mean, I now use mirrorless, so there's no such thing as live view, but Live view and zoom is, I meant to put, use live view and zoom 
so you get an exact focus on the moon. Don't rely on just an infinity setting. Infinity settings are really misleading. So, um, you know, again, zoom in on, on what you're looking for, in this case, the moon, and then focus stack it in Photoshop. So for example, here's my shot of the month for that uh, moon. This is a chapel that's there. And uh, it was a bright, bright orange moon. It was just incredible. And the only way you can do this is I had to focus on the moon there and I had to focus on the chapel, but otherwise it's all one shot. And by the way, this one is not from the project. I went ahead, I took some shots of these, uh, what do they call those mausoleums, I guess. And then I did Photoshop the moon in here, but that was just so I could do a fun thing for Instagram. <laughs> November wind turbines, I love wind turbines. To me, and I know they can be kind of controversial, but a lot of you are from Texas, which I think is the number one state for wind turbines. But there's a certain, from a photography standpoint, whether you're you know, pro, pro fossil fuels uh, or pro uh, renewable energy, from a photography standpoint, there's a certain uh, grace and yet bulk to them. It's almost sort of a yin yang energy you get from, from them. So I go to the Eastern Plains of Colorado where we have all of our wind turbines. And this was the shot I was going for, and I got it. I got so lucky. Um, and to me, this is almost like mom and dad, mom and dad uh, wind turbine holding hands, looking at all their little offsprings while the moon rises right above this one. And you see this little magenta layer here, that's atmospheric distortion um, that gives a beautiful effect that layer begins to lift. And I won't go into the whole science of this, but it begins to lift. And then you get what's called a twilight wedge. So this is basically the exact same place I was, but now I'm using, that one was probably maybe a 100 millimeter. This is more maybe, I don't know what I used on this, maybe a 200 millimeter, but I was really, really close. But you see the dark blue here is, this is the shadow of the earth, right as the sun goes down, it has to be just right. And then that little magenta layer lifts and then it dissipates. So it just makes for a really cool shot. You know, it's not manipulated with colors in any way. Home stretch, the last month I did, remember I told you I wanted to get a shot of the moon going over the mountains. I was lucky, December had no clouds whatsoever. I got, well, this is, this was my backup shot. I went the night before. And now this is, this you can see is a wide angle lens. This is why you don't do wide angle lenses for moon, unless again, it can be just part of it. Uh, this is heavily cropped and I was standing right in front of this. This is downtown Denver. And this is a tree that they decorate with lights. The colors change, et cetera. So that's kind of cool. It was fun to be down there. But the one I wanted was what I got the next morning. And I know it looks like I used two different focal lengths. I did not, um, but I probably did. In fact, I know I did two different focusing uh, on, the, um, on the mountains and then on the moon just before it set. Uh, it was right at uh, just as the sun was coming up. So that's the end. God, I did almost talk as fast as I did it out of Chicago. No, you did great. You did great. Uh, if anybody wants to screenshot that, you can do that now mm -hmm. or take a, use your camera phone. Um, Paul, I'm going to get you to take that screen down. Yeah. Um, I was rolling through here. I didn't see a lot of questions, but um, there was a, um, I, let me just say right off the bat, February was my favorite shot before you showed anything else and mm -hmm. I thought we're done February and then you showed the one and I don't know it was the angel with the trumpet oh yeah um, that, that, that was yeah. pretty compelling too so those are my two favorite shots so oh. if you guys want stick in your stick in the notes in the chat which was your favorite yeah. shot so that he can see that um you had let me just recap uh the two lenses that you said you use the most are your 70 to 200 and your 100 to 400. And I just want to repeat that because um, that, that's something that is always really cool to, to, to make sure we cover. Um, 
I'm looking and, and people are starting to throw in which one's their favorite. So Chris, Christy from New Jersey, she has a real name, but that's what we call her here, um, agrees with me that February was her favorite. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Liz is going to say that July is hers. Um, the thing about these projects, and I did one under COVID not realizing that I did a project. You know, mine was, I had been doing it for a couple of years, but um, during COVID, I spent time on a back road and looked for wildlife and watched the seasons change as we were pretty much paralyzed from traveling long distances. And that was one of the reasons that I thought um, your presentation would be really interesting um, was it, it's a personal project. You could do it from your home state. And, it, and it's one of those, it offered you challenges, but it also this was technically, quote unquote, your backyard. Mm -hmm. And it, it really, I mean, we've had, we've had a crappy year and a half for photographers that, you know, just can't get out and, and do. And this project was, you just found another way to get out and explore and create this comprehensive um, journaling of your experience. And I'm so, so pleased and so grateful that you came and shared because one of the things that I really wanted to get through with the happiness hour, when I kind of, you know, sat down, what do you want out of it? I want to connect with people. Um, you and I've never met, but I know now where you live. <laughs> so the next time I come to Colorado, I will probably reach out and say, Hey, um, but what I really love is your presentation was about inspiration and you probably inspired yourself to look at those challenges and try to figure out how you can get around them. And um, someone texted me in the middle of your presentation and said, he's a great speaker. <laughs> so um, that means a whole lot when I get those messages. Um, and you've inspired, maybe, maybe the moon isn't something that people are going to rush out and, and do, yeah. but it doesn't matter what the project is, create a project for yourself and get out and, and, and do something with it, even if you never share it with anybody. So, right. um, um, so creating people go do create. So, um, you're, you've ticked some boxes from me and that's what I want when I ask people to come back, come and do a presentation so yeah and you know I, there were times i thought i would give up uh, it does oh. take discipline no matter what your project is it takes diff discipline and um yeah there were times it was like oh you know i i think it wasn't until maybe august where i said i'm so close i am going to finish this no matter what nothing would have gotten in the way unless something very, very serious, but, right, right. you know, yeah, it, it takes some discipline. Okay. There's, I'm going to slip this one in. Susan says, I can get shots of the moon, but don't know how to get the foreground when it's night. And she's wondering if you could just talk about shooting the foreground. So if it's at night, you definitely have to do two, two shots. So just do a shot that will expose the foreground. So let's say that temple um, I did, <clears throat> you know, I maybe had to shoot that at 20 seconds. That one had to be on a tripod. And that's another thing. Um, if you don't want to shoot it on a tripod, sh always shoot the day before so that you're doing golden hour. Once you start getting blue hour and nighttime, you really do have to be on a tripod. Okay. So, um, so yeah, you know, be, you know, so I exposed for that. I made sure, you know, I looked at the back of the LCD screen and made sure it was exposed uh, correctly. And then from the exact same spot, I took a shot exposed for the moon. And again, the moon is especially at night when it's white like that, when it's higher up, it gets brighter. Remember, that was one of my planning tips that the moon gets brighter. Well, the light reflecting on it gets brighter. And um, so you have to you have to be really careful. I think like one one twenty fifth, one two fiftieth of a second was when it's at its maximum brightness, what you want to do. And then 
you blend them in Photoshop, um, you know, and I, I mean, that's all different. You know, I won't go into the weeds on that, but if you know how to blend uh, or at least do layer masks and just kind of, you know, work around that, um, you'll get a great shot, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, thank you for coming and sharing what you know that this, this is just, um, that means a lot to me. And I know you don't know me, but I, I get super excited when strangers say yes to me. <laughs> 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 and then the next thing you know, I talk them into doing something else for me. So um, expect that email. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, shut down your presentation. So is there anything that uh, you, you forgot and you want to just say before I close out this presentation? No, I, I really appreciate being asked. I consider it an honor and I love, you know, sharing what I've done and, you know, just hopefully someone just got inspired by this. That's, that's my biggest hope. That's what I hope. In any way, shape or form. Yeah. I agree that I, I hope that, that uh, you kind of, kind of like, you know, made somebody think about Hey, there's a full moon coming. Maybe I can just try and 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 um, and if that's the case, and you guys do create something that you want to share, um, and let Paul know. Hey, you can connect with him at paulmalinowskiphotography.com. Mm -hmm. And if you're on Instagram, please give him a follow at Paul Malinowski Photography. And I'll be sure to add those links to the show notes. So next week, Liz Crane will be here to present creative exploration with mobile devices. So until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.